Good morning, everybody. Wonderful, wonderful to see all of you, those joining us online. Those of you on holidays, listen to the sermon after you finish your holidays. Yeah, I understand quite a few are traveling in, or traveling back this week. You know, we bring our uh, series of Connected uh, to an end today. And uh, as we move into uh, thinking of next year, from next week onwards, you know, we started the whole series just understanding this word connected. And who are we connected to first? We're connected to Christ first. It all begins with Him. It continues with Him. It ends with Him. Amen? Okay? So that's where our life is in. So we, we, have, we sing songs like, My life is in you. You know, yeah, our life is in us. And many a times it's not a physical understanding of that, but there's something that takes place on the inside of our lives. Connection always begins with the heart. You know, yes, God's grace is there. And I think I sent out a short uh, uh, video or a TikTok thing, but just about a minute or so. And I thought I explained the whole idea of God's grace being there. But for us to receive that grace, we must first believe it, right? Yes, now everybody? We, we must believe because uh, salvation, where does it begin? I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. You see, I can reason with my mind, but I may never believe it, right? Uh, I can have a conversation with somebody. It sounds so good, but my heart can be so disconnected with that person. So it all starts with us connecting in our hearts, our hearts surrendering to God. Because our hearts is the very seed of all of our emotions and our decision-making, isn't it? Everything. Our heart drives so much how we feel, how we react, how we respond. We want, we don't want, we love, we don't love, we hate, we embrace. Everything is from the heart. It starts there. And we all want heartfelt relationships rather than just head-felt relationships. Is that not true? We, we want a heartfelt thing. When you, when you uh, want a relationship that is, uh, you know, with the opposite sex, and uh, you, you know, or whether it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband and a wife, it has to be a heart connection, right? It cannot just be a superficial connection. So when we think of our relationship with God, there was, and that, I, I, I mean, I think we all know this. Uh, I've talked about it many times. I struggle and I watch uh, sometimes just online sermons and they say, if you've prayed this prayer, that's it, you're in heaven. But I, it's not a magical potion, you know, it's not abracadabra, you know, this is not, what is it, Harry Potter, you know, okay, ting, it, it's not. It's this thing that Jesus came. We sang all this. Christ came. Jesus came. Christmas is, is around. We've got the trees. Uh, we've got everything. And uh, you may have a tree at home. You may not have a tree at home. But everybody is envisioning presents under the tree, right? <laughs> the younger ones are all shaking their heads. The older ones are saying, yeah, I have to pay for that gift. And uh, the greatest gift... It's something we celebrate not once a year, we celebrate it every day. And that's the gift of Christ giving us eternal life, salvation, His love, His forgiveness, His acceptance. We must connect there. If we don't connect there, then coming to church, then saying I'm a Christian, holding a Bible, is just something we have as a motion. It's religion. It's not a heart connection. And once that heart connection takes place, then we connect with God's truth. You don't become overnight somebody so good. Every day is a process. So we falter, we make mistakes, and that's where God's grace is. As we continue to believe in our hearts, as we continue to embrace Him, as we do, we, we call it, whether it's devotions, reading our Bible, praying, uh, keeping in touch with the body of people, uh, you know, cleaning up our language, cleaning up the way we think, uh, you know, the process of how we engage in life, uh, honesty, integrity, and all these different things. That heart connection, okay, I, I, I need to 
because I want to bring this to an end. So I, before I really talk about what I want to talk about today, I need us to understand how this comes in play. That heart connection is so critical with the Lord. Because if I don't make that heart connection, last week I talked to you about you can decorate the tree with the best decoration, the most beautiful lights, the most expensive stuff. But if you don't turn on the switch, nothing happens. So we want to call it faith, we want to call it whatever it is when we connect. And that's when, as we read this, it begins to shape our hearts. It begins to shape our minds. It shapes our relationships. Every day, God works upon our lives. So if our, our life with God only works once a week on a Sunday for about an hour and a half, we will most definitely struggle with God in our faith. We'll struggle. Because after that connection with the Lord, we connect with His truth. As we connect with His truth, we connect with others. Our relationship now, we do it horizontal, now we do it verti vertical, now we go horizontal. We work with people. We connect with one another. We understand what it is. We are all sinners saved by grace, needing the grace of God, needing the wisdom of God, needing the, 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 the mercies of God, needing the strength of God. All that we need to daily change, daily become more and more of what He defines there for us. So don't be, don't be discouraged. Don't be disappointed. But that's where God gives us community so that we help each other. So it's not like, hey, my private life is my business. That's none of your business. Actually, that part is such an individualistic culture that doesn't figure out or doesn't come into the culture that God wants us to have. So it's never mind your own business, it's my life, it's not your life. And, and we, as we are young, we also say that to our parents, isn't it? It's my life, it's my choice. Of course, but when we connect with God, that no longer works because to grow and to mature, we not only have that connection, we have the connection with one another. And that's when it's, a, you know, in Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron. We remove the parts that don't really work, that we are struggling with, we stumble. And we begin to connect with one another. How do we do it? In friendship, in fellowship, connect groups, in prayer, in serving, all these different ways. So when we don't come here, I, I think, yes, for a season we could say, COVID, pandemic, yeah, I will sit at home. You know what, actually, in, in all honesty, unless you're some far out place, you know, connecting, we actually have zero excuses to come to church, connect. Because I, this is me, I think we are so afraid to have our hearts change. We keep a distance. We don't respond. We unfriend people or we drop off from a chat. What happens? We have this disconnect rather than a connect. Or we have limit conversations, limited. I won't do, I, I will, I will. I'll. That is not how we define or express our connection with God. And that is so critical. Because then we literally miss a whole part of the dynamic and this life of being connected to Christ when we disconnect with others. When we disconnect in prayer, when we disconnect in this thing called life together. It's the heart. Last week I talked about the last part I wanted to bring, and it's two weeks, last week, this week. It's this whole issue of prayer. Now we talk a lot about prayer but for me, prayer, and I think when, uh, not just for me, uh, it comes from the scripture, it's an issue of the heart. When we look at Luke 
11.1. Something that the disciples saw. He was praying in a certain place, Jesus. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, can we read that together? Can everybody do that besides one or two of you saying it loud? Come. What does it say here? Teach us to pray. Stop. Lord, teach us to pray. Not Lord, teach us how to cast out demons. Not Lord, how to walk on water. Lord, not to have, uh, you know, how to heal people. This is the only thing. This is Lord, teach us to pray. They saw something in Jesus connecting to the Father and something that happened in the time of him praying, because when we read in the Gospels, every time Jesus spent that night in prayer, or he went away to pray, you notice that you read in the Gospels, he would come down, and that would be the greatest demonstration of the Spirit, be it the multiplication of the, of the five loaves and two fish, be it the healing, being the raising of the dead. See, we, we, all, we look at the outcome but we don't see the source. Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. How are we to pray effectively? We cannot pray effectively if we do not want to be taught, if we are not going to look at Scripture, and if we don't come together to pray, our prayer life just remains mediocre. It's never going deeper. It's never connecting deeper into the heart of God, deeper into the purposes of God. And yet they say here, Lord, teach us to pray. I think that must be a cry of all of our hearts. Lord, Teach me, I want to be a student of prayer. I want to, why? It's not just something that I do. Please listen, it's something that I am. Lord, teach us to pray. But I cannot learn if I don't want to be taught. And the lessons they learned in prayer wasn't just Number one, you do this. Number two, you do that. Number three, we see it in the book of Acts, manifested, expressed, and they touched thousands of lives. We see the gospel preached. We see people's lives touched and changed. We see everywhere God's light invading darkness. And what we read it, the world is changed. And because of what they did today, you and I are impacted by it. So we're going to look at one Old Testament passage, and we're going to look at a couple of other passages uh, as we proceed today. And uh, Hosea 10, verse 12, uh, there are seven thoughts that come through. I'm not going to deal with seven points, uh, just four. Uh, But I want us to look at this. It says, so righteousness for yourself. Uh, some versions will say so in mercy. Yeah. So 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 righteousness for yourself. Reap the faithful love. Reap faithful love. Break up your unplowed ground. It is time to seek the Lord until He comes and sends. Righteousness on you like the rain. If we look at the the seven parts, this will be at least seven in my mind. Can I have the next slide, please? One is breaking up. It says, break up the fellow ground of your heart. Fellow ground means hardened ground. A ground that once produced, but no longer produces. So he says, break up. That's preparation for prayer. 
Next, please. We'll just go through the unplowed ground. Hindrances to prayer. Would you agree with me? There are a lot of hindrances to prayer. And sometimes it's just not the devil. And sometimes it's just us. It's just not distractions. It's many times it's us. Next, please. Time. He says, break up your fellow ground. Uh, so break up preparation, you know. Uh, then the distraction third is time. The urgency of prayer. There must be a sense of urgency in our hearts. Yeah. Seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. The tenacity, the discipline, and the passion of prayer. Until, he says, until he sends the rain. He sends the rain. It's the persistence of prayer. He comes. Until he comes, he sends the presence of prayer. And finally, showers of rain, the answers to prayer. I want to start with the first thought is persistence, persevering, prayer. Now, if you, if, of course, if you Google this, this word, uh, persistence, perseverance, you look at the dictionaries, it kind of, they, they run into a few words, but they consistently come back to these few thoughts here. You take hold of something and you do not let go. Jacob at the brook of Jabbok. What did he do? He grabbed hold of the angel. It's believed to be Jesus. He grabbed hold. He said, I will not let you go until. Bless me. I'm, I'm not. You try. You, can, you know what? The only, only way I'm going to let go is if you kill me. I, I'm not going to let you go. Many a times... You know, I shouldn't say many a times. All of us have this tenacious attitude. It's either used for the right things or all the wrong things. Because we can be so stubborn, we don't want to change. We can be so stubborn with something, we call it, you know, digging our heels in. We can be so stubborn about something. And, you know, somebody say, oh, yeah, that, that stubborn person, yeah, very stubborn. You know, if it's at home, yeah, just like your father, stubborn, you know, just like your mother. We can be so stubborn for the wrong thing. And yet God says, be stubborn for the right thing. So, so the idea is, do not let go. Have you, of course you've seen bulldogs, but have you seen a bulldog grab hold of somebody's rear end? God have mercy, make sure it doesn't grab our rear end because that'll be the end of our rear end. The bulldog, the jaw, once that bulldog lands, sinks his teeth, his jaw into that flesh, there's no way that bulldog is going to let go. When we read this, when we think of persistence and persevering prayer, we're not going to let go because we do not permit ourselves to be distracted. Let's not be distracted from the goal that we are pursuing. We are thinking of uh, Christmas at home. We're thinking of those who are not well. We're thinking of those who need a touch from God. We, we're thinking of those who need to turn back to God. We're thinking of something of a breakthrough that we need. Many a times, it becomes a casual prayer rather than a persistent prayer. We give up too soon. We give up easily. But that persistence says, I am not going to let you go, Lord, until. Can you imagine? And you know, God doesn't play hide and seek. When we seek Him, we say we'll be found of Him. As we push in, God reciprocates by His grace, by His presence, and He wants to come and invade our lives. And last week I talked about invading the impossible. If we want that persistence, we, we want to break those walls down, there needs to be this persistence, per, persistent perseverance. Yes, five-minute prayer is good, but five-minute prayer is not going to cut it if you need a breakthrough. It's not going to cut it. You know, when we get into trouble, all of a sudden, we know how to call others and say, please pray for me. But that same persistence, tenacity disappears when things seem to be all right. 
we carry on casually. This is a daily thing. So we are not distracted. This is where <clears throat> I, I say two desires collide. Two desires. What is the first desire? God's desire where he says, God desires that none should perish. We find that in Peter. None. What God's desire? For God loved. What? God came. God wanted to bring, reconcile. Christmas is a great reminder of God's heart, God's desire that all men everywhere should hear of His amazing grace, should hear of His plan and purpose. But you know, we are His instruments. And this God desire, His, His passion, His dream, His envision, hey, you know, I don't want any to perish. But this is where our will collides. It says, God, none should perish. And I'm going to stand in the gap, God. And together we're going to work with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm going to share what I need to share. I'm going to prepare myself. But Lord, I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to pray because they matter to you. But those two desires must collide. When we don't connect with God, we don't seem to pick up His desire for others. So prayer isn't just, tick, I've done my devotion. No, it's more than that. It's more, <coughs> excuse me, it's more than that. It's His desire and the heart cry from our lives that God will touch those people that we are reaching out to. And if it doesn't happen this Christmas, we're going to believe it, it's going to happen next year. It's going to happen at Easter. If it doesn't, we're going to believe that it's good. Lord, I'm going to keep knocking on that. I'm going to keep knocking. How many of you, <laughs> those of you at least who are married, I mean, you are quite persistent in chasing the person, isn't it? <clears throat> this is where persistence matters. Do you know, there are about 650 different kind of prayers in the Bible. You, and you read from Genesis all the way. You know, just different places of prayer. And... Uh, there are 450 recorded answers to prayer. It's a good average. The Bible record. if you look at the Gospels, 25, time, 25 places you see Jesus getting into the place of prayer. Well, at least that's what I seem to have discovered. Bring at different places, different times. Jesus modeled prayer, not just for the disciples, for us. And that's why the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, you're not going to ask me to teach you mathematics or physics because for the love of God, I can't do it. How can I teach you something that I don't know? Lord, teach us how to pray. The expression of prayer is more than 700 times in the Bible. It tells us something, isn't it? It's the heartbeat. One more slide. Persistent, persevering prayer does not give up until the power of darkness is broken over the person we're praying for. We're willing to lose some sleep. We're willing to give up some meals because I want to say that. My second thought quickly is break up. As we read that, you know, break up the fellow ground. Let's look at this. Now, it doesn't say consider to plow your heart. That word break up literally speaks of a commandment. That means I will need you to do this. If you want to see the result, you got to start here. 
And it speaks of the heart. So it's a clear thing. So, clear thing for what? That means it demands us to do something about the condition we are in. You know, we're going to come to the table of the Lord. In part of the scripture, it says, inspect your life. Before you come. So don't, don't sin against God. Don't sin against yourself. So when you come, hey, quiet your heart and look at areas and say, Lord, there's some areas in my life I, I need to get right here, Lord, and I, I need your strength to keep overcoming. So this whole thing break up. It demands. Everybody shout this word, demand. <laughs> okay. It demands that... I do something about the condition that I'm in. In simple terms, when a kid is all messed up, he'll say, go and wash yourself up. Look at the mess that you are in. You know, go and clean up. We, we say, the whole idea is do something about what you are right now. It says, earnestly, Seriously, look at the hindrances in our own hearts that stop us from having a persistent, tenacious time of prayer or engaging for others, standing in the gap. In our personal life, in our church prayer life, what are the things that hinder us? Is it casualness? Is it, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't have to come. God. So we ask ourselves these hard questions. What is the hindrance? Is it my own opinion? Is it just the lack of my desire to do that? Why? The connection must be there. When two of you agree, it speaks about, so when you look at prayer in its entirety, it's powerful, but it starts with my heart, isn't it? Is there this deep desire, this persistence, this perseverance, this, this conviction in my heart? What do I see prayer as? What do I really think prayer is? What do I understand corporate prayer as? What do I understand coming together, worshipping together? It all begins in my heart. If I cannot see the change within my own heart, where I begin to embrace God's truth rather than my opinion, then I remain stagnant and my opinion seems to be higher than God's truth. So to break up means I deal with my excuses, I deal with the reasons, I do not pray with others. I deal with the issue where I do not want to go on the normal comfort area of my prayer. Everybody all right? It's the last part of the series, so I'm going for it. But it's, it's not just the last part of the series. It's something that we reflect as we pull the curtain for the year, as we think of 2023, because we just don't want another mediocre year. It's not just, wow, I, I made, you know, I got six months bonus. Wow, I'm looking for a pay rise. Let's say, God, I want to come up to another level. I'm going to go deeper with you because I really want to see your light shine in all the lives of these different people that I know. That's important. So this is an agricultural picture. A lot of the Old Testament, the language, because they were mostly what? Farmers, okay? So it's agriculture, break up. Uh, I, I think at some point I told you, one of my lecturers it grew up three generations of uh, farmers. And he said when the ground became uh, unproductive and it just, was re it just left alone and it doesn't grow anything anymore, but it once grew amazing fruit trees and vegetation, when the ground is left for such a long time, they said even many a times when they bring uh, the tractors, the hinge in the tractor can snap because the ground is so hard. So it is said that you need the you know, real heavy rain because the, the water table has dropped so low from the ground that you need about six to eight 
rounds of heavy shower for the water table to start coming up. Just think of that, it takes persistence. For the water table to start coming up before the ground can be now broken, tilled, where oxygen can go in again and they take out all the different things that shouldn't be there and they fertilize the ground again, they, they heal the ground and they put seed in and once again now that ground will grow and bear fruit. So it's an agriculture picture. So to break up, uh, as I thought of it, this is how I just coined it, okay? To break up means making every effort to remove from our heart, every operative word, every, our mind, because our minds may not be the most clearly focused, isn't it? He focused on other things. Making every effort to remove from our heart, our mind and our spirit, things that don't allow God to have His way in us. You say, come on, Pastor, I love God. But we need to ask, and I ask myself these questions often, how much of God do I allow myself in myself? Do I allow God to really have that standard in my life in all that I do? You know, if, uh, have you seen those, those old barrels, the wooden barrels? Um, we've seen it, maybe we've seen it in movies or cartoons. And you realize it's a few planks of wood, right? And, it, and it's uh, cured and whatever else, and then they, 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 they put uh, the sealant on the inside, and then they can fill it with water, yes? Water or wine. Now imagine one part of that barrel, just imagine with me, one part, one strip of that wood is halfway, but all the other parts are full. What will determine the water level in that barrel? The lowest part of that barrel. So I can say I'm doing well, but that part where I'm really not getting, that's where it's leaking out, isn't it? So it's allowing God to work in my heart, my mind, my spirit, and really being very honest with myself, which part do I not allow God? And this is the, the thing I, I will say, oh, I, I tried, I, I can't break this habit. No, I don't think you hate the habit enough to deal with it. I can't give up smoking. You can, because you did, when you were born, your mother didn't put a cigarette into your mouth. And here's, take a puff, baby. Come on. Uh, what do you mean? You know, what, were you two years old and you were watching pornography? Were you three years old? And you, come on. We learn our habits. Come on. We learn our habits. We embrace our habits. We can give up. And just like periodical fasting is also good because we'll say, oh, I die if I don't eat meat. You won't die. You won't die. You just have less red meat in your life. That's all. It means that we admit our spiritual condition. Can I come in? Can I, can I look in the mirror and can I honestly go before God or can I with somebody accountable and say, you know what, my, my heart actually is, yeah, actually I'm not really there. How can we do this together? It means that we admit our spiritual condition, that it is cold and my heart, the condition of my heart is hard. That I would want to be responding in repentance with a clear intention it starts, and repentance is where? In the heart. It's not a mind thing, it's like, my heart is broken, Lord, my heart is remorse. Oh God, I really want this to change. With a clear intention to surrender our hearts to God, so that what? So God can work in and through it. It begins with Him, it continues with Him, it ends with him.
It's not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, but it's, Lord, I, I want to do everything to change and I want to make a commitment to do it. It's hard work. Anybody tried uh, farming? No, okay, no. Maybe you tried growing some stuff in your house, maybe? You, you, is it easy? We like all these easy things, isn't it? A plant that takes care by itself, waters, it's, you know, you just put, and everything is, you look, look at my garden, but it's all so artificial. Nothing connecting to it. We want everything done, automatic. We don't want to work at it. Yeah? We don't want to work at it. World Cup is going on. We ooh and ah at some of the, the, the skills of these people. They were not born with a football in their feet. They, they had to make that effort. They have to give up. What is it that I am willing to give up in order to break up and to engage with God and say, God, I want your desire and my desire to, to cross over, to meet in the center so that God, these people that I'm praying for will encounter you. It's hard work to deal with unproductive unfruitful, neglected areas of my heart. Why? I'm comfortable. I don't want to change. I don't, I don't want to clean up my life. I love the compromise. I love to go and hang out with all these people. I love to do those things. I, I just love the compromise because it's so entertaining to my flesh. I, I know this is not the most uh, entertaining uh, sermon. But as we think of 2023, we need to ask ourselves, what is that unproductive, unfruitful, neglected areas in my heart, of my heart? I need a renovation. I think it's Dallas Willard who wrote that book, isn't it? Renovation of the heart. It's simple terms is this. I have to do it. It's not somebody doing it for me. Why? Because it's my heart. Everybody with me? It's my heart. It's the same way we say, it's my life. Yeah, and it's your heart. And if I don't make the effort to deal, <coughs> excuse me, to deal with it, nothing is going to happen. If I don't take scripture and read it and pray over it and say, Lord, yes, I, I see this, oh, this part of my life. Lord, I, I come before you and, and I want to, I, Lord, I embrace this truth of yours, Lord. Give me the strength. Today as I go, Lord, hey, if you don't, interact with the word, you don't interact with God, nothing is going to happen. So an unattended heart, a cluttered heart, a hardened heart, is where we become cynical. Huh? We become cynical. We become critical. And what happens? Hardness creeps in. True joy is gone. True joy. Do a checkup of joy. Am I, am I joyful? Or do I come in with a dark cloud, thunder and lightning over me, you know? And when as I come in, the whole weather changes in the, in the, in the, in the house, or whatever, this whole, you know, hey, you know, I, you know, it's like I dip myself in a bottle of vinegar and smile. Smile. What else do you want me to do? Smile. You happy? Joy in our worship. Joy. In, in telling people about God, joy in friendships, joy in our work. Has there, have we lost that joy? So for the Chinese, you'll sing joy to the world, you know, not yet. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> so you, you can translate for the rest, okay? So hey, joy, what happened to joy? Uh, have we lost the joy and the enthusiasm of serving? Have we lost the joy and enthusiasm of praying, of telling others about God, of generosity, of connecting with one another? Is it gone? Where did it go? Have my excuses and my arguments drowned out God, God's word and his wisdom? Doesn't it say, Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In our world, fear, we always think it's a different fear. No, it's not that. 
Right now, 30 seconds. Just pause and I should hurry because we still have the communion. What? This question. What is the condition of my heart today? What is the condition of my heart? Not somebody else, my, my heart. What's the condition of my heart? What's the condition of my heart? How am I doing? What's the condition of my prayer life? What's the condition of it? Is it just about my needs? Or will there, can I come to a place when I'm quiet also and I'm enjoying God? I'm just enjoying. Can I just push this a bit further? When was the last time we can actually read the word, enjoy it, and actually just enjoy God rather than say, God bless me, God give me, God do that, God. It's, it's just coming. You know, you sit down with a friend and just having a cup of coffee and just enjoying each other's company. Friends. Abraham was a friend of God and yet his intercession would touch cities. Let's look at the two scriptures and then we'll celebrate, okay? They call it the mother of all parables. On the day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables saying, consider the sower who went out to sow. Agriculture, again, the sower has a seed and of course the seed has to go on crown. As he was sowing some seeds, as he was sowing, some seed fell along the path and the birds came up and ate it up, ate them up. Others fell on rocky ground where there was not much soil and they sprang up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop, some hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. That's a good yield. Anyone who has ears should listen. We all have ears, right? Just in case you lost an ear today. Yes. <laughs> but it's whether I am listening, isn't it? I can be hearing but I may not be listening. But I'm also listening with my heart, isn't it? Jesus explains this. Let's go there. He said, you then listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand, it's not like, oh, I don't understand. It's the embracing of truth in just the simplest form, Okay. It's not that I don't understand. No, that, that's not what it's saying here. The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. There is an intense spiritual warfare taking place every time you read the scripture, hear the scripture, and want to engage God. Why? The enemy refuses for you to find your most amazing potential in God. Because it's the word that works on our hearts. So if I'm just treating it casually and I'm looking for all the bless me scriptures, guess what? My heart is full with myself. He says, it snatches away. This one, this is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground this is one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet has no root in himself, but is short-lived. When pressure or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now, no, okay, we'll stop there. Okay, verse. It says shallow ground. We can have a receptive heart or we can have a resistant heart. Anything. Now, today, in many ways, you are being challenged with the word, right? Yeah. 
It's your choice. You can say, this is an inconvenient truth. This is not what I came to listen today. Because that's the shallowness of my heart. And guess what? Because I may say, yeah, I want, but I'm not wanting, I can't make that effort. I can't give this up. But you receive it for joy. And, and you know, many people say, oh, spruce up your Sunday service. Have more excitement in the worship. You will get excited for 20 minutes, but will it change you? If it doesn't change you, you go out and you live that same then what's the point of that worship? Did I engage in that worship with God? You, you understand? That excitement, if I just come for that excitement, how does it translate to transformation? Okay? Everybody, just act like you, you, you are seriously or serious about this and say, yes, that's, that's me, okay? Let, let's do that. So, so there's no root. Pressures come. When the word you know, I get excited, but then I realize, oh dear, it's too much effort. I'm not going to do it. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but, everybody shout, but. But the worries of this age, the seduction of wealth, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. That means the potential of fruitfulness is there. But my response to what's happening around me will determine that. I can get excited, but the moment I go back and tomorrow the share market is going up, oh man, and, and next thing the week is over and says, oh dear, yeah, I wanted to do devotions. Oh, I completely forgot. Nobody is asking you to take a vow of poverty. God is not asking us to do that. But wealth has an amazing enticement, isn't it? Life, you know, comfort. All these things have a way of stealing what God has for us. Now he says, but the one sown on good ground. And the challenge is here. We all can assume that we are good ground. But if we assume we are good ground, there must be this place of fruitfulness, of growth. Oh, sorry. There must be that. From January to December, there must be some measure of growth in my heart, in my mind, in my faith, in my engagement with others. There must be a measure. If you have a relationship and it remains the same way. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm okay. How's parents? Okay. How? It doesn't work that way. Relationships go deeper. It is when we stop having the conversations, marriages can be stale. Relationships become stale. And I feel sometimes our walk with God becomes stale. and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who does bear fruit and yields 160, 30 times a person. Where am I at? Why? Because our hearts, can I have that please? I need to rush through this. No, yeah. Our hearts are filled with too many distractions. Can I finish it? Filled with good things and desires that rob God things. Rob God things. On the flip side, a responsive heart is an honest heart. I, I, I know where I'm at. I admit where I'm at. Admitting its condition is open to God wants to know his ways, and desires change. We can't put that off. Uh, let me read you some quotes. St. Augustine, I like this. He said, Oh Lord, we have this here. The house of my soul is narrow. Enlarge it that you may enter in. 
it is ruinous. Oh, repent. It displeases your sight. I confess it, I know. But who shall cleanse it? To whom shall I cry out? But you. Let me just quickly go to number three, number four. Let's let me do number three quickly. It's time to pray. Would you not agree, everybody? It's time to pray. It is time to pray. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, yeah. He then told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. It is time to hit the reset button to reconnect with God and with others and with prayer. Right, a bit more, yeah? It is time to break the hard, unproductive ground of no prayer, no evangelism, no generosity. It is time to plow our hearts and to stop making excuses. It is time to seek God. It's time to seek God. He says, number four, he says, pray until he sends the rain, which means don't stop praying until. We'll say, isn't it? Wait there until I show up, right? Don't leave. Wait until the door opens. New apple comes out. We queue up the night before until those doors open. <laughs> then we go and get it. Why? We are so determined to get that thing. Apply that tenacity to say, God, until that life turns and comes to you, until the situation turns around, God, I'm not going to give up. It's hard work. Yes, it's hard work. It's a lot of hard work. Until. Let me read you Andrew Murray and George Muller. Andrew Murray wrote uh, amazing stuff on prayer and somebody who led that prayer. Yeah, be, believe it, South Africa, right, Herbert? Amazing, amazing person. He, he says, um, the chief elements of importunity, that means persistence, simple. That means you're not, it's, it, the idea is I beg and I push for something until I get it, okay, for something. So he says, the chief, the main elements of importunity in prayer are perseverance, determination, and intensity. This three, please go back. Go back to that first slide, please. The one before this. Okay, yeah, thank you. The main thing here, he said, is perseverance, determination, and intensity. When I look at it, sometimes we just read those words, we get tired. But that will shape our prayer. Next, please. It begins with the refusal to accept a denial. A, it didn't happen. I refuse to give up. I refuse to take no for an answer. I'm going to knock and keep on knocking. I'm going to ask and keep on asking. I'm going to keep doing it until. It begins with the refusal to accept a denial when the request is not answered the first time it is made. It grows to the determination to persevere to spare no time or trouble until the answer comes. That means if it's going to take more time, I'm going to push it. It rises to the intensity in which the whole being, your whole life, your whole person is given to God in supplication, prayer. And the boldness comes to lay hold of God's strength. At one time, it is quiet and restful. At another passionate and bold. Different kinds of prayer. Eh? Sometimes it's that quiet. Sometimes it's that aggressive prayer. Now it takes time and is patient. Then again, it claims at once what it desires. In whatever shape, it always means and knows God hears prayer. I like the last part more than anything else. I must be heard. Is my voice silent in prayer? Is my voice silent in prayer? Have I silenced myself in prayer? Have I endorsed that silence? Do I celebrate that silence? 
We don't stop until the rain comes, until the prayer is answered. We don't stop, we don't give up, we don't lose heart. That's your next slide, please. Okay, maybe the musicians, you can come up. Let me read you um, George Muller. One person who seriously inspires me. It is not enough for the believer to begin to pray. It's not enough. Nor to pray correctly. It's not sounding nice. You know, sometimes you hear children pray, wow, you're so clever in prayer. The fellow lives like a devil the next few minutes. I mean, no. It's not, it's not the language, wow, so beautiful. It's the simplicity of the child praying and expressing its heart. Even though it's incorrect English, who cares? Isn't it? Who cares? child is connecting its heart to God. If it's all grammatically wrong, I'm sure God is having a good laugh and saying, I hear you. It's us. It is not enough for us. It is not enough for the believer to begin to pray, nor to pray correctly. Nor is it enough to continue for a little time to pray. We must patiently, believingly. Where do we believe? Our hearts. Continue in prayer until we obtain an answer. Further, we have not only to continue in prayer until the end, but we have also to believe that God does hear us and will answer our prayers. Most frequently, we fail in not continuing in prayer until the blessing is obtained. And in not expecting, we don't continue, we are not tenacious, and we don't have a heart that reaches and says, I believe your word, God. Expecting the blessing. Can we stand as we prepare for the communion? I just want you all to wait here. In prep, in preparing your heart for this morning's communion, I have these three thoughts to bring this together. Am I afraid? to plow the hard ground of my heart. Am I afraid? Oh, I feel I don't need it. Am I afraid to plow, plow the hard ground of my heart? Am I afraid? Am I afraid to commit myself to the breaking of my heart, hardness in my heart, because it's inconvenient, but because I, I reason it out. church, don't you think so? Yeah? It's time to pray. We need to stand in the gap. Not just to close the year well and start the year well. So that we become all that God has designed us to be. Salt and light. So that our hearts connect deeper with Him. We need the Lord, right? Come on church, we need the Lord. We need the Lord. Come on. We, we need Him. We need His wisdom. We need His direction. We need His strength. We can go in our own strength, yes. But we will never get to the destination design if I do it in my own strength. We may be saying, wow, you don't know how well my bonuses are coming in, how well I'm doing in school, how great job is. But maybe you can do better, more more purposeful, more lasting, more impactful in the lives around there if we were to receive strength and wisdom from the Lord. 
That's the difference. That's the difference. Oh, thank you. It says in the scripture, those who sow in tears will surely reap in joy. That's the next thing. Will surely reap in joy. Let's, let's do the last scripture. The last scripture. Then Jesus went to all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out the workers into the harvest. It's not, Lord, I pray, send the rest out. So literally the idea is, hey, like Isaiah, God says, who shall I send? And he says, here I am, send me. the seven targets this is we started Monday we still want to continue two more weeks can I have that all the points pray a prayer of blessing over your family for our church and all that we are doing it's not just oh Lord bless all the meetings it's that Lord let us dig into the purpose of each time we come together that we go those who we are reaching out to you are reaching out to inviting for Christmas at home Christmas day for all those who need healing, there are many who need healing, but can we be tenacious and stand in the gap there for them for what we want to accomplish in all our 2023 plans for dignity we just had the staff vision retreat with over 200 of them. It's a lot of work. And pray for Malaysia. Vision 618. Pray. How many times? At all times. We talked about that last week. In the spirit with every prayer and request. With all kinds of prayer. And stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Last week I closed with this. At all times, all types of prayer, all together. Would you take a few moments? Say, Lord, it is time to seek you. I want to seek you, God. Lord, I want to reconnect my heart with you. With your purposes, Lord. Help me. Would you just take, just do that? as the communion comes to you just wait for each other don't worry about peeling it off just hold it but will you take a good few minutes musicians everybody everywhere engaging with God saying Lord touch my heart Lord change my heart oh Lord. Thank you. change my heart oh God Lord I want to seek you oh God I want to seek you Grace extended 
forgiveness given to me. Lord, today as I remember your goodness, your kindness, your generosity, Lord, I pray that it will not stop there. That as I have received, Lord, now I extend that to others. God, that I will stand in the gap. I will reach people. I will connect to God with the way you desire me to. Help me, Lord. Let's stick the bread together. Thank you for your body broken, Jesus. Let's stick the bread. Thank you for your blood, Lord. The cup. Where you are at, you make the commitment to the Lord. Lord, your desire and my desire, let them collide together today, Lord. And let the outcome be lives transformed and changed. People around blessed. Your name exalted. Your will to be done. Your kingdom to come. Lord, I bless you. Will you just take a few moments? On spirit, keep on praying. Lord, our hearts reach out in conversation to you, God. Come, Lord, soften our hearts at all times with all kinds of prayer. Just engage in prayer right now. Just pray. Just pray for your own heart right now. And, and just begin to say, Lord, I, I want to pray for the person I'm reaching out to. Will you do that right now? Will, will, you reach out, will you reach out to the Lord for the person that you want to see encounter His love and His forgiveness? Will you take a few moments? Just pray for that person right now. Or that person. Let's take the time. Church, come, let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. Oh, Jesus. Oh, come. Touch their hearts. Oh, Spirit of God. Amen. We just want to pray for one more item here. We want to pray for all those who are not well. We want to pray for Kwa. He really needs a miracle in his body for Eric. He needs a miracle in his body. We want to pray for that. That the complete restoration in Naomi's body. We want to pray for that. We want to pray for that right now. We want to pray for, for Angela. God, completely healing the, against all the arthritis in the name. Come, just stretch out to them. And begin to ask God's healing. Come here when he's at home. Just begin to pray around those who need healing just, just lift up your hand and let's intercede for them say God touch them send your word bring healing bring restoration to their
their bodies, oh God. Oh God, restore them, we pray. Completeness in their body. Well-being of their bodies, of their health, in Jesus' name. I pray at some point today it was quite a bit of discomfort in all of our hearts to know that truth is never convenient, isn't it? Because it's a sword, it, it penetrates, it cuts and says, let's deal with these things, let's deal with it. But it also propels us forward to embrace what God wants, amen? It embraces them, we embrace them. As we continue praying this next few weeks, we're going to have a time of fasting. Next week, we're going to, of course, have the time of uh, doing the training as well. I don't like the word training. But we're going to think together about sharing God's amazing grace that way. Just three points, different things. We want to do that together next week, okay? And we're going to talk about Vision 2023. Where we are headed, what we want to get done, what we want to see. So come and, and those that you don't see today, oh, some are traveling, but get others and say, come on, let's move forward together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray the Lord's prayer together. Will you pray? Our Father in heaven, help us to honor your name. Come and set up your kingdom so that everyone on earth will obey you as you are obeyed in heaven. Give us our food for today. Forgive us for doing wrong as we forgive others. Keep us from being tempted and protect us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let me bless you. And now may the God of peace, who raised from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, by whose blood we have God's everlasting covenant, also equip you with all that you need to do His will in every good work. God working in you what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, everybody. Thank you. Let's press it.
I can't do it for you. There's a song written on your heart only you can sing. And when you sing, enemies flee. When you sing, prison walls come falling down. When you sing, heaven invades the earth. So just begin to lift up your hallelujah. Raise it like a banner. Raise it like a flag. 